Welcome back to the tech channel, everyone. Today, I'm going to be running through some classic setup mistakes, what you can do to avoid them. And these, I've actually drawn inspiration from mistakes that I've made myself on my bike, and it's made it pretty horrible. So without further ado, let's get on the tools. First mistake we're going to talk about today is actually your setting your saddle position. Obviously, there's a lot of adjustability with this, and there usually is a kind of optimum position or sort of range of positions that's going to be give you a good, efficient pedaling position that doesn't have a big injury risk. But I think you can make the mistake of thinking that that's a kind of fit and forget kind of thing. And actually, if you can tailor your saddle position to the riding you're doing, that can be really helpful. So, for example, this rough height on my Canyon Spectral, that's kind of where I set my saddle for the majority of like pedaling around. But I've just been doing a lot of riding on an uplift where I wasn't pedaling and I found that dropping that saddle down about 50 mil uh, really helps get the weight over the rear of the bike and flick it around. And I wasn't pedaling for very long, so it suited that use um, way better. And then I put it back up for kind of regular riding. A couple of things to note if you are playing around with the seat height, slamming it down for those sweet jumps is uh, firstly just to be mindful of not pulling out your dropper cable or doing anything like that. So you can just maybe slide it through the frame or adjust that to take, make sure that's in the right position for, especially if you're raising your seat again, you can um, make your dropper rise up underneath you as you ride, which isn't, isn't what you want. <laughs> uh, and the other one is just making sure that, and this is only gonna happen on some bike, but just if your seat's right down, it's not gonna foul on the rear wheel when you're bottoming out of suspension. Um, so you can, if you've got an air shock, you can test that out. Maybe just let the air out of your shock safely and, um, articulate that suspension fully just to make sure it's not going to run into the rear tyre, um, which, as you can see on this bike, there's about an inch of clearance left, so you're all good. Another of the classic things I see a lot actually still out in the woods is people with brake levers that are really steeply low. And I know there's a lot of personal preference with this, but I do find it so much better to have your brakes quite high up, like not horizontal, but not far off. Um, so let's have a look at bringing those up more in line with your arms. We talk about uh, kind of like matching your brake levers to the angle of your arm and having a straight wrist. And I think that's good, but it doesn't, I mean, this is how I run my brake levers normally for riding. And if I sit on the bike, it feels like my wrist is sort of bent and locked out. Um, which I think when it is a bit locked like that, it can kind of set you up in a stronger attack position as well. Um, but that, so it looks wrong, but actually that's the height that really works super well and it's helped brought my riding on so much to have that up. The important thing to note is, it's the same with the saddle height, not having a one size fits all position because I've had it before on like a long cross country ride on my race bike, which was quite aggressive and it had a high saddle, a slam stem. And when I had my brake levers up, that was really good for like an hour and a half race and control. But if I was riding all day, it did fatigue my arms a little bit because I had a lot of weight on my hands. So just tweaking that a little bit, bringing them down for a kind of marathon style ride was really helpful as well. So just, I'd bring them up, see how that feels, but then don't be afraid to play around with it as well through different rides. The vast majority of brakes these days are gonna have some external adjustability on the levers as well, probably reach and free stroke. So if you're moving them up and down, you can dial that in and out and make sure that it's, it doesn't made it feel too weird. You can get it in the right position for um, kind of how your hands wanna sit. Another mistake that I've made before actually is um, getting a bit confused about my low and high speed damping settings and associating high speed with riding fast because then I must be using high speed circuits. Uh, so I've like adjusted that in anticipation of riding quickly and made my bike really bouncy and horrible. Um, so I wanna just take a little bit of time to talk about the difference between low and high speed compression and rebound damping. Before I start talking about how to adjust damping, uh, just super quickly in case anyone is confused, uh, on your suspension, uh, you've got either a coil spring or the air that provides the actual like spring force. Uh, and then the damping is usually oil circuits that just slows that down and allows you to control the action a little bit. I'll start off with compression damping. So that uh, helps control the suspension and provide a bit of support as you compress under an impact or a force. And uh, that on a lot of products these days is split into low speed and high speed, which in this case, it refers to actually the speed your suspension is moving at, totally independently of how fast you're going. Uh, and this, on these forks, can be found, you adjust it at the top here, at the top of the damper, there's low and high speed compression. Um, now, low speed, that typically refers to like a, a sort of movement action when you're on the bike, either it's pumping or it's the diving force under braking or you're going up a jump, something like that is normally in the, the kind of low speed range of when your suspension is being compressed and high speed, that's 
hitting an edge or going over some chattery roots or something like that. So um, it, that could be a low, you could be going really fast and then go through a compression and that's your low speed circuits or you could be traveling quite slowly and hit a curb and that would activate the high speed compression damping. So um, just getting your head around that has helped me a lot for setting my suspension up right. Um, what I found is actually riding more high speed over the ground trails, so maybe a really fast flowing kind of bike park track is actually I need to adjust my low speed compression because um, I'm experiencing more G-forces, harder braking into berms and stuff like that. Um, so if I add um, a click or two of low speed compression, so that's more damping, so I slow the compression down, uh, it stops me diving a little bit, it gives me a more supportive ride. Um, and if I had, if I do have separate adjustability on my shock, I'll do that as well, um, but definitely on the forks. So if low and high speed compression damping are referring to kind of how fast your suspension is being hit, uh, low and high speed rebound control the speed at which it rebounds after an impact. So returns from a comp compressed position up to just normal sag. Um, and this, the, the force that provides that rebound action is from your compressed air or your spring. So the more that your suspension was compressed, the kind of faster and harder it begins to rebound. Um, I think that's the really key thing to think about with rebound damping is that it actually, in order to rebound, your suspension must have stopped moving. Um, and it doesn't have a memory, so it doesn't remember how fast it compressed, and it must actually go through a stationary position before it returns, which is a nice example of the intermediate value theorem for anyone who wants more maths content on the channel. But in any case, you, you have to think about how much is your suspension compressed, and then that's thinking about the circuits that you need to adjust in order to control that action. So if it's only squashed down a little bit, it's going to spring back quite slowly just from the top of the stroke, and you can adjust that with your low speed rebound damping. And in contrast, if you've bottomed out, it's going to spring back really fast from that compressed position and you adjust that bit with your high speed rebound damping. So for example, I tend to run quite a lot of high speed rebound because if I've had like a big bottoming out hit, I don't want a massive quick bucking action. And also those hits don't, to come, don't tend to come that often, hopefully. So you've got kind of time for it to spring back smoothly. Whereas for the, the really small chattery repeated hits on the, like, the top of my suspension, I want my suspension to be back in a extended position quickly and it's not gonna like, throw me off, so I run much less low speed rebound damping just to get it back up quickly. The final thing to say on suspension damping is, uh, is something that I've tried to take from other people is just to adjust one thing at a time uh, if you're out riding and then you can try and isolate the effects of that and understand how each thing affects how the suspension rides. The next one is sort of two things in one, all to do with bolts and tightening them up. Um, firstly, in terms of doing bolt checks, which I think is a really good habit to do, especially if you're kind of riding somewhere really rough where things inevitably do come loose. But something we see, <laughs> or someone was saying, someone from SRAM was saying this to me the other day, that like everyone tightens up bolts that really don't come loose very often, and then they neglect bolts that do. So basically anything that's involved in a moving part, um, one of the key ones is uh, bolts in your brake levers that's sort of around the pivot, pivot bolts themselves, pedals is a key one, um, and anything else that's actually moving is the first things to check before seat post clamp and your stem and things like that that don't tend to come loose very often. The other thing about bolts is not to do them up too tight in places that don't need it. So if you do have a torque wrench, uh, use it, um, especially with carbon stuff, I think it is quite easy to crack it. Um, and then for a lot of stuff actually doesn't need to be done up too tight and you want it a little bit slack. So your control clamp bolts and your seat post, I find if I have them tight enough not to move, but if I hit a tree, they're gonna move, not break, is very helpful. Um, and carbon grip paste is your friend in this situation, particularly for your seat posts. That's something that helps it or not all seize. Um, so just kind of learning, if you don't have a torque wrench, you just kind of feel it out and uh, don't swing off the Allen keys. Apart from, you know, stuff like your cranks, your pedals, they do all be done up pretty tight. Now, cleat position. Obviously, this is specific to people with clipless pedals, but I think if you do run flats on a regular basis, you will kind of know where you put your feet on the pedals for a nice, solid descending position, and that kind of illuminates our cleat position. Um, now, if you have your cleats all the way forward, okay, maybe it gives you a few watts in that top-end sprint because you have more leverage on the cranks if you can turn the cadence. But uh, something we've seen in World Tour Road Cycling, kind of drifting across is people moving their cleats back because you then move your feet in a smaller circle, which adds up over the day and it saves you a bit of energy. Uh, so that's something I've been playing around with. And also just to get your nice dropped heels and a kind of 
solid position on the bike. Having your cleats right aft has made such a difference to my riding. It's only a movement of, you know, maybe three mil, but trying that out has really helped. So um, I really recommend that for everyone to at least give it a go. Uh, finally for today, I'm talking about handlebar width uh, in terms of a sort of fit and forget approach like we've spoken about with controls and saddle position. Um, there's been a big fashion probably in the last 10 years for bars, get, they got wider and wider and wider and now they've maybe come down a little bit more and I think whilst a wide bar obviously it gives you that leverage and stuff like that, it, if you're too stretched out it's not as a strong position as being slightly more set up with your shoulders I think and it can just be a little bit unwieldy particularly for tight technical terrain. So something you can do to kind of experiment with that because cutting your bars down is quite a simple job but it is a commitment. Um, is if you've got open-ended grips, slide your controls and your grips in just little bits because it doesn't actually take very much to change. You know, five mil doesn't look like much when you actually do it. Um, and that gives you the opportunity just to try a slightly different handlebar size and also combine that with maybe with rolling your bars because as you move your grips in because of the angle of the bars, that's going to change kind of where it sits spatially. So if you want to try and just sort of isolate just the width have a think about the, the role as well. Thanks for listening to my setup tips. These are things that I think have actually helped me get my bike to the point at which it's helping me progress my riding. So um, hopefully that's been helpful for you guys. And what is helpful for me is your comments because uh, I appreciate the feedback and there's always stuff we've missed as well. So it's really useful to hear about your main setup tips. Uh, and the more comments you leave, if, if the video has helped you, that boosts the, our engagement in general and that helps us reach more people for our compression damping setup tips. So thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching and we will see you next time in the next tech video.